I am running because I truly believe we have the most awesome state. We have the best people, the best resources. We have oil and gas. We have a river that runs through our state. We have uh, the, the coast. We have agriculture. We have seafood. We have food. We have culture. Uh, we have a fantastic state. I believe that the state is truly dysfunctional in the standpoint of spending and leadership. I have been a banker for 29 years and I own my own small business, but I'm a Louisiana resident as well. I, I've, I've paid attention to Louisiana, Louisiana politics all my life, and I feel that this is the best option for us, the best avenue, the best opportunity for us to make a change in the state of Louisiana. It just takes good folks down there. We have that ability. We have that shot this time. We've got so many folks that are term limited. We need to make a change in the Senate. We need to make a change in the Senate leadership. We need to make a change in governor. We need to build a larger conservative group down there to make this state much better. We're tired of being on the bottom of all the lists out there. We have an opportunity to make that change. It's just it's going to take the right leadership, the right teamwork in South Louisiana. I believe that having a business background, both a business degree from Southeastern and an MBA from Centenary, plus the 29 years of banking, and my understanding of how state government works, I really truly feel like we can move this state forward. Infrastructure is a huge problem in Louisiana. Obviously any Louisiana resident, and for that most, anybody that drives through the state of Louisiana realizes that. One only has to cross over the border into Texas or into Arkansas or to really Mississippi to see that they've made the investment in infrastructure. We have the money. The problem is how we spend it. So much of our money is tied up in, in um, statutory spending. We've got a list of projects out there that are fully funded, such as the Jimmy Davis Bridge. We just can't get the money. I believe that what happens is North Louisiana gets, gets really uh, set to the side when compared to South Louisiana. We, we drive through South Louisiana and they're making uh, infrastructure repairs everywhere and yet we don't see many of them up here. Um, one drive down Linwood and you need a, a tire alignment. Uh, it's a terrible situation. The money's there. We need to allocate more money, obviously. We need to make the investment back into our infrastructure. Um, it's not just our streets, though. It's our bridges. You look at the Jimmy Davis Bridge. You look at um, our water situation, uh, um, um, pipes busting. We had one by my neighborhood the other day that literally exploded. Um, we also have in the small rural communities throughout the district, and I would guess throughout the state, problems with lift water stations. Uh, there's so many issues that, that there's a backlog. It's just to be able to free up the money and make it happen. And there again, it's still a leadership issue. We've got to be able to work together and decide which projects come for first and address them and get them done. Those taxpayer dollars are sitting out there. We have to roll them back into the communities that, that have paid that money in and, and make those repairs. The I-49 connector is huge. It, it, it truly will link up uh, I-49 and, and increase travel through our, through our district, through our, through our city, through our parish, um, and we need that. It, that. That helps thrive business. It helps drive uh, community. It helps drive spending in the community. That money's been earmarked. Thankfully, the legislature, with the leadership of Larry Bagley, has, has gotten that money for us. Otherwise, I, I truly believe we'd have been left out. That money has federal matching money available. We have to ensure that we get that federal money. I'm not sure that it's enough to, to complete it, but it's sure enough to get started. And with the federal matching money, we should be fine. It is critical that we complete this project and, and complete it as fast as we can. We, we need the visitors. We need the pass through traffic. We need the, the businesses and communities that pop up along the I-49 corridor. We've, we've got to finish this project. First of all, the, the, the words of deficit is really a, a play on words. We have a, 
a balanced budget requirement as part of our constitution, which means every year we have to we have to start with zero and end with zero. We can't really have a deficit. When you hear deficit, really what that's talking about is they want to spend more money than what we make. Um, and we've seen that the last four years. We started four years ago with a budget of $24 billion, which is still huge, especially for a state this small. Um, and, and now we're at a budget of $35 billion, and yet we have nothing to show for it. And really, that's when you start looking at where that spending's going and, and why is it in our infrastructure and why are we raising taxes. Um, looking at the, the surplus, the surplus just tells us that we've, we've been overtaxed. Um, that, 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 that tax increase was not necessary. Um, the legislature said it was not necessary, but it, it, it happened anyway. Um, and now we're sitting here with a surplus. We really have to look at how we spend our money. Um, we have to decide what's most important. We have to free up the, the statutory dedications that we have um, and, and look at every single dollar. The, the, the way we need to address our budget is, is to remember that it's our taxpayer dollars. It comes out of your pocket. It comes out of mine. We need to decide what projects are required. We need to decide how we spend that money. Um, we need to set money aside in the rainy day fund. We need to address infrastructure. Um, we can't keep raising the budget. You, you keep raising the budget, which means we obviously have to keep raising taxes and, and folks are leaving the state. We're, we're left holding the bag with ever increasing taxes. We need to look at streamlining personal income tax in the state, making it more, but a cheaper, easier place to live um, and quit attacking our wallets. There's two ways to look at it. We can, we can address the issue of the statutory dedications, the earmarks. We can look at them from a legislative standpoint and really undo a lot of them through a legislation. But if that doesn't work, and it's been tried time and time again, if it doesn't work, a limited constitutional convention is really the way to go. Um, in that constitution, in that convention, you look and you address line item by line item every single way we spend our money. And it's not necessarily to say we want to just go through and, and, and scrape the plate clean, but really do a study of how we spend our money. If we don't know where our money's going, we're, we're not going to be able to track it. We're not going to be able to produce how we spend that money. The problem that you've got to look at with a constitutional convention is who are the representatives? Who are the delegates that sit down and decide what the next step is in the Constitutional Convention? You've got to choose them wisely. In my mind, a Constitutional Convention, the delegates need to truly be balanced and be representatives of all people of Louisiana and not one party over the other or, or one constituency over the other. Um, otherwise, you set yourself up from failure and it's nothing but a fight. Um, if we truly drive Louisiana forward through the use of a constitutional convention, it needs to be fair and equitable from day one um, with, the, with one purpose in mind, and that's it's simply driving the state forward. Availability is key. When you look at early childhood development, there's a shortage. It, obviously, we have to have places that are, are licensed and, and, and monitored and, and, and truly um, on task with what they're doing. There's just not enough of them. There's usually a waiting list everywhere. Early, er, early childhood development, early brain development, early knowledge is, is fundamental. You read about and hear about the best time to, to teach a foreign language or music is in that first stage. Um, we have to have more facilities uh, that, are, that are available. The curriculum is key. You've got to have a curriculum that is stimulating but not overtaxing at that young age. Um, they, they wear out too quickly. And the third piece of that is you need to have a curriculum that ties in seamlessly with the K-12 through program um, that, that needs to be a streamlined program. So availability is, is, is really the first issue. As far as K through 12, the issue that we face, and, and, and my wife is a teacher, I have, I have family that are teachers, and the issue that we face is we are constantly challenged to find the right curriculum and the right method of, 
of teaching the youth, what we find is that it, it constantly starts over. You know, for many years, Louisiana was working on teaching teachers and, and programs on how to teach all the youth, and it varies depending upon how people learn, and not everybody learns the same way. Not everybody can be put in the same box. But yet, over the years, we've gone backwards in that we are trying to put everybody in the same box. We roll out one curriculum, we, run, we roll out one testing standard, we teach the teachers on how to teach the material, we, we re-educate the, the kids on how to learn differently, parents on how to do homework and, and, and teach differently. Um, frustration rises and just as we seem to figure it out, we change the whole game. We change the curriculum, we change the testing standards, we can't seem to move forward. It creates a level of frustration that is felt not only in the teachers and in the school board offices, but also at home with the parents and the children. Um, you know, our dropout rate is falling, but at the same time, you've got kids that are calling it quits as soon as they can, as soon as they graduate from K-12. I think part of that is the curriculum, it is the rigorous testing standards, it is not being able to, to gain any momentum. You, you need a curriculum and testing standards that are challenging, but, but attainable. Um, you've also got to work with your, your teachers and be able to build some, some steam, build some motivation, some momentum, and it's difficult when it's constantly changing world. Um, we also have to look at how these kids are learning. You know, the, the kids now, obviously, they're in a modern world with computers and cell phones and online classes, and yet we're still sitting there with textbooks and pieces of paper. Um, we need to address that. I believe that kids are learning, in some instances, a little faster. Um, we need to, to look at different options there. Um, as far as the higher education, um, it really truly is about workforce development. It, we try to squeeze every child into a four-year college degree plan and that's not the case. But yet our employers, our future employers, are looking for kids that are trained in IT, agriculture, oil and gas, um, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, you name it, and we don't really provide the programs as we should for all those students. We need to keep all students in mind, not just those that are going four-year. It's a difficult issue that's been around for a while. I believe our unfunded liabilities are $18 billion or around that. Um, the carrying cost, which is the interest on that liability, is, is crazy and, and we're lucky if we can just cover that. Um, it's, it's a tough answer because you, you definitely have to make sure we take care of those that are enrolled uh, in, in the retirement plans and, and there's, there's no reason to change that. What you have to look at is how the retirement plans are managed. You know, what are the costs? What, what are the efficiencies? Um, you know, what are the risks? How are they doing? If they're just thrown into mutual funds, what's the risk there? The other part of that is we have to make some allocation in the budget. It's somewhere and, and set us, maybe it's setting aside a certain percentage every year to pay down those unfunded liabilities, whittle them away. Um, they're not going to go away on their own. It's a problem that just keeps passed from, from legislature to legislature, but we have to address them. Of course, as a state, you've got to be profitable enough to be able to set that money aside organically if we can grow business, if we can grow income, and not by taxes. Um, in growing taxes, we should be able to take care of that unfunded liability. It's just going to take us a little while. I believe that the only list that we rank at the top is worst place to live, and that's depressing. We are at the bottom of every list out there. We have problems, however, I'm convinced that our problems are not difficult ones. I think we have to address what other states do better than we do, and there's no reason why we can't mirror them. You know, when you look at the state of Louisiana the last year, you sit there and you look at states next to us, such as Texas, who gained 285,000 jobs, Arkansas gained 2,500 jobs, Mississippi gained 11,000 jobs, and we lost jobs. The national economy has been growing for the last 10 years and yet we have not. Um, the last four years have been strong. We've not taken advantage of that. Our budget has increased from 24 to 35 billion. We have nothing to show for it. Um, we've got to make a change. Again, it's a leadership problem. 
Um, we, we have got to address making this state cheaper and easier to live in. We have to make it a business friendly state. We have to make businesses, give businesses the ability to thrive here by taking the regulations off of them, by taking the taxes off of them, letting them grow. If they grow, they're going to grow jobs. If they grow jobs, then you've got a situation where there are not enough employees to cover the jobs, which means pay increases organically through competition. We have to develop a workforce to, to, to meet those needs. I had one business owner that moved 60 employees, a division of his, to Texas because we didn't have the workforce development to take care of them. That's jobs, that's income, that's tax dollars, and that's, that's families that are lost. Um, we have to address tort reform and making, making this a less litigious state. We want companies to come here. But if you look at our trucking companies, our logging companies, um, not only is it our personal insurance dollars we, we pay out of our wallet ever increasing, but for them it's ridiculous. And a lot of those companies, the trucking, the logging, the oil and gas, have to finance their insurance premiums. Um, this, this, country, this state is a litigious state. We need to do what we can, pass tort reform, make it less litigious, reduce insurance, create workforce development, create jobs, and keep our kids home. Our kids are leaving, our families are leaving, our companies are leaving, and it's, it's, it's our tax base that's leaving. However, I know we can do it with a change of leadership, some fresh ideas, and everybody pushing in the same direction. Well, I guess there's two issues that, that, that I think about often and, and depending upon the group is things that I mentioned. And, and I try to be a, a half glass full kind of guy, but the first thing is when you're a banker, when you're studying numbers, when you're helping businesses grow or businesses start up, you're looking at trends, you're looking at forecasting, you're looking at numbers. When you look at the national economy, as I mentioned earlier, that's grown the last 10 years and yet we, we've not. Um, that 10-year cycle typically, if you study the numbers, lasts five to seven years um, on average, and we're out there at 10 years, which means there's a downturn that's coming. We don't know when, but it's inevitable. If Louisiana could not take advantage of the growth of this nation, and especially the last four years, and, and we, we made no, no strides forward, um, how are we going to do when the economy hits the skids, when, when we fall? And again, that's coming. We're not prepared for it. We only have 3% of our budget, annual budget, set aside in a rainy day fund. The statistics show that you need 18 to 30% set aside to be able just to hold the ship on even keel. We're not prepared for that. We have to address that. We have to reduce spending. We have to fund the rainy day fund. We have to grow business and income organically. Uh, the other piece of that is going to be um, we, we are coming up on redistricting. We have lost so many of our, our folks to out of state, we are at risk at losing a congressional district. We don't need that. That's less representation on national level. It's also a situation where we're going to have to redo the House and the Senate districts throughout the state, um, which can, can be tough to do. Um, and so we've got to address that. When you talk about redistricting, that's not a four-year problem, that's a 10-year problem that we have to deal with because it occurs every 10 years. We've got to, we've got to make sure that that goes fairly. Uh, we've got to make sure it's done right. We certainly have to fight not to lose a congressional uh, delegate. Um, we need to maintain our strength in Congress on a national level to protect us and move us forward.